Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a Christmas present for the Biden administration webinar, Build Back Everything uh, in America 2020. Thank you so much for joining us today. The National Infrastructure Bank of 2020 uh, Act was introduced by Representative Danny Davis from Illinois and Seth Moulton from Massachusetts on March 31st, 2020. The bill's number is HR 6422. This piece of legislation uh, has been uh, introduced on the last day of, uh, that they had in Congress before the pandemic really hit and has uh, started to move forward in many circles. Today, we are going to, we have a group of panelists that uh, we will discuss what can be done with the bank in order to be able to move uh, America forward. There will be uh, panelists joining us today to talk about uh, their uh, specific issue, as well as their geographic area and region to talk about what can be done for the bank or what can be done with the bank. <clears throat> a national bank is not a new idea. Right now, we currently use pay as you go. And this was an idea that was actually brought to us by Alexander Hamilton uh, when uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War, when he took over and became the first Secretary of the Treasury. It was a time when America needed to be able to have the lending power to be able to uh, basically set up the government that was needed. It was done four other times in our history, John Quincy Adams, Abraham Lincoln, and the last time it was done was actually by FDR in order to help America get out of the Great Depression and also win World War II. Today, it appears that this is a uh, time when a national infrastructure bank is needed once again. And the reason a bank is needed is simply that with the global pandemic that's going on, our GDP, uh, the last quarter was horrendous. We need the, the kind of investment in America to be able to make America what it needs to be and what it should be going forward. This whole presentation is designed to uh, inform you and let you know about our efforts to be able to try and make the National Infrastructure Bank Act of 2020 a reality. Today, as we move forward, we will listen to uh, all the participants and we actively are looking for your questions so that we can get answers to you. Uh, there's a Q&A uh, button or the chat. You can use either one and we will try and make sure that we get those questions answered as we're moving forward. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to ask all our panelists to please turn on their videos so that you can see who they are and then we will get started. Uh, I will have Alfeka Mutardi, who's a macroeconomist, kind of give us some background and uh, information if she would. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. It's very uh, great to be with you this evening uh, to talk about our Christmas list for um, incoming President Joe Biden. Um, I would like to uh, propose a, a Christmas shopping list for you. Uh, which I've prepared today, and I'm going to need your help in filling it out a little bit further. So uh, as, as uh, Bob has told you, our previous speaker, we have an introduced bill, uh, which is currently to be able to lend a total of $4 trillion uh, for infrastructure all across the United States. But uh, in our next uh, incoming Congress, we'll need to reintroduce the bill. And we're going to propose to the writers that on account of an increase uh, in estimated needs for water infrastructure just by itself, uh, we really need to increase the size of this bank to $5 trillion. Uh, uh, those will be our uh, spending needs over the next 10 years. And that will cover all infrastructure in the United States for which existing funding does not exist. So we'll be, we'll be closing fully this funding gap for infrastructure. So I have gone shopping uh, and I prepared a list so far of projects that we might cover in the first year. And the intention here with this list is to include projects 
that are shovel ready, ready to go. They're longstanding infrastructure projects uh, that for which the funding has not come along, but the engineering studies have been done. The land is acquired or already owned from the past and uh, the project uh, specifications meet regulatory uh, requirements. In addition, we want projects that will hire a lot of workers uh, to get started right away because of course we're in the middle of a, a very severe economic recession and downturn. So hiring folks as soon as possible, uh, even if they're unskilled workers will be really important to get people into great paying jobs and then to provide them with training uh, as time goes along so that they can uh, advance to more skilled positions. And we also want to hire, uh, we want to uh, push forward projects that are in high spending areas. So out of this five trillion, for example, uh, we, we plan on filling the financing gap identified by the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers of one trillion just for roads, bridges, and uh, that kind of surface transportation. Another 1.1 trillion for water infrastructure. And then we have down below, I'll show you some, some high speed rail projects as well. And we wanna provide, uh, so we want to be in those high spending areas and then we want to provide uh, full broadband access everywhere, which Erica White is going to talk to you about in just a little bit. So I've got a list, a shopping list uh, for Christmas time started here. And what I've indicated, uh, I took some of these items off of um, the 2017 uh, list of suggestions for President Trump uh, that came from Republicans for, for projects that were ready to go. And also in addition that were done by the Obama administration uh, and the treasury department on projects that have already had their cost benefit analyses uh, and those kind of things done. And then in addition, high critical projects that we've identified through articles in the press. So let me just go flip down a few of these to just to kind of give you a flavor here. And then I'm going to ask for your help in adding more to our shopping Christmas list. So this, this project, uh, this uh, financing will cover one large project uh, in New York, which is the Gateway Project, uh, which requires $30 uh, billion uh, over uh, maybe a 10 year period. Uh, it'll be all the aspects of the Gateway Project. Uh, in addition, we also uh, really have a huge crisis going on with the New York uh, Metropolitan Transportation Authority, which is really financially under the gun and has a backlog of, um, um, of maintenance projects that it needs to do. So that we're gonna put in another 12 million there to do uh, uh, short-term financial aid for that, uh, that entity. Then some other um, um, road projects, bridges, uh, this includes the Brent Spence Bridge, which we talked about in our last webinar that caught on fire a few weeks ago and is now temporarily closed. Uh, it'll uh, include things like the um, red purple line, uh, uh, subway lines in Chicago and some other road projects. Then we want moving on to water. We want to replace quickly all the lead in, uh, that, have, are, that have identified in metropolitan areas in their, their water projects. Here's just one example of a uh, severe water problem in the uh, city of Chicago that will require $10, 10 uh, billion to uh, re refix the lines in th 360,000 homes uh, going from the street to the homes. Uh, that, that's a high priority project to do to get, to get that lead out of the water. And there's many other metropolitan cities with lead problems in their water. Uh, last week, we had a, a webinar with some uh, water folks who know a lot, a lot about stormwater systems that need re to be repaired. And they have a list uh, in 22 states uh, that, of stormwater projects that could be, that could be repaired by, with a million dollars worth of uh, funding. Uh, in addition to that, we um, have some dams and levee projects that are identified, uh, some airport projects. Uh, we have a nationwide proposal from Amtrak uh, for uh, ten, for ten, uh, sorry, for twenty-five billion dollars, that'll be needed to to extend a whole lot of rail lines all across the United States, and that will include a, an extension of a, a line from New York to Scranton, Pennsylvania, is just one example in that in mix there. We have a PPP project in Maryland that fell through with bad with bad management and financing. Uh, that's the Purple Line that uh, will really alleviate traffic. A congestion from Baltimore to Washington. And so our, our bank can take over that project as well. Then we have five lines that were proposed by the U.S. High Speed Rail Association as 
is ready or already started and ready to go. These are billions of dollars in projects right here, which will uh, create a whole lot of jobs for workers. And then we have our broadband projects, which Erica's talked about. So, but it's still not enough. Even though we've identified all these projects, we're still only up to $340 billion over maybe a 10 year period. And we need to spend $5 trillion over a 10 year period. So we need your help to identify any projects you want to put on our shopping list, please just send us a, an email, uh, give us the name of the project, maybe a link to it. Call up your, your state department of transportation and ask them for all the roads, bridges, and so forth projects that have not been able to get funding. Or call up your waterworks companies and ask them for their projects that they need to get fixed right away too. And let's put them all on our shopping list for Joe Biden, the things that we can do in our first year. We start with these projects in our first year of operation of the National Infrastructure Bank. So thanks very much for your time. I'm gonna pass this now over to Sandra Clausen from our coalition. Sandra. Thanks so much, Elfeka. Hello, everybody. Um, my report today is about my efforts to engage and organize meetings with the Biden-Harris transition team so that our coalition partners can introduce and offer up our National Infrastructure Bank Christmas gift. One result of these efforts is that we were invited to a November 27th meeting by Kenny Thompson Jr., one of the transition ambassadors to the private sector and PepsiCo's head of external affairs. His transition colleagues who joined the meeting were Anna Gomez, Biden review team for the Commerce Department and partner at the law firm Wiley Rain. Also attending the trans uh, from the transition was Catherine DeWitt, volunteer for the Commerce, Commerce Department review team and manager of the broadband research initiative at the Pew Charitable Trust. 10 of our NIB colleagues joined the meeting which was initially scheduled for 30 minutes, but extended to one hour due to the keen interest of the transition members attending. At the end of the meeting, Mr. Thompson volunteered to arrange additional ones. And today I'm happy to report he texted me that he has sent a request to the labor and transportation re uh, agency review teams and will follow up with them this week. Additionally, I've contacted the transition director of day-to-day -day operations, Johannes Abraham. Johannes asked Carlos Moni, a transition agency review staff member who was director of public policy at Twitter and former assistant secretary for transportation policy under President Obama to reach out to me. Mr. Moni and I spoke and he asked me to provide dates for prospective meetings, which we did and he is currently working on scheduling them. Uh, I'd like to say that at our meeting, we stressed the bipartisan character of the NIB that it was the only funding mechanism with the capacity to manage the $5 trillion scale of infrastructure need while also remaining deficit neutral, and that it is an essential tool to build US infrastructure jobs and the economy back better, and thereby bring a shared prosperity to all Americans. We also noted that prosperity creates unity and that a key goal of President-elect Biden, in addition to building infrastructure is to foster unity. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sandra, for uh, that update to be able to do it. Uh, we are now going to uh, uh, ask uh, Representative Joe Ceresi uh, from Pennsylvania uh, to give us an update, uh, not only on the House resolution that he was instrumental in, but uh, also uh, what's going on in his region. So, Representative. Well, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. I'm in the car and I apologize. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Um, and it's interesting that I am in the car because I had to travel down by car to the city of Philadelphia, uh, which is about a 45 minute ride from my home to drop something off at my son at college because we have no public transportation in my part of Pennsylvania, which is what I wanted to speak about tonight. Um, I am the representative of the 146th district. I see one of my colleagues is on this also, uh, Representative Brzezinski who's in a different part of the state. I represent Montgomery County, which is the third largest, um, um, uh, third largest county in the state of Pennsylvania with 830,000 people. And I'm in the Western part of the county, which was the older part of, of the county for a long time was farmland, which has been developed immensely over the last 20 years. And one of the goals of one I would like to put forth and one of the gifts to uh, President-elect Biden is we have the opportunity to restore what we all know as the Reading Railroad. 
Um, the Reading Railroad runs 62 miles from the city of Reading to the city of Philadelphia. It was taken offline in the mid 1980s. It runs through about 25 different towns, multiple counties, and hundreds of thousands of people would be on the Reading Railroad line. And we have a coalition that's moving forward to try and restore this railroad. It would bring billions of dollars to the local economy and create hundreds of jobs in the process. So the state of Pennsylvania, where we were known for railroads, um, through the 80s, some of the railroads were eliminated in a lot of parts. And you're seeing a lot more movement now in this state to bring back the railroad and public transit. Now, everything we've heard already, water, infrastructure, all that, those are all massive projects that we have here in Pennsylvania also. We have some of the most efficient bridges in the nation. And years ago, we put a tax on gas. But as we've seen with the economy and people driving less, that's drying up, no pun intended on that. Um, and we have to find other sources to fund this. And this bank would be a wonderful source to be able to do that. So I look forward to working with all of you, hearing about the projects and seeing how we can work as a nation to restore uh, jobs, to restore these types of infrastructure issues that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Ceresi. Uh, our next uh, presenter will be uh, Councilman uh, Rodriguez from New York City. Councilman. Thank you. If, I think that this is like one of those biggest, big projects and initiatives that I hope that uh, we will be able to continue adding more voices uh, in a bipartisan effort to be sure that we leave this infrastructure bank as a legacy for the future generation. And I can talk about the MTA. As everyone know, I, uh, the MTA is the largest public transportation system in the whole nation. It has a value of $1 trillion and the capital budget that we approve or that the MTA approved with funding from the federal state and the city, it was supposed to be from 2024 or $29 billion. However, what we have seen now is that the MTA from March to today has seen a reduction of the ridership that went down from 7 million people every day to 300,000. So as a result, this public transportation has a deficit of $19 billion as we are speaking today with the possibility to reduce services on a 40% and increase the fare in the next couple of weeks. So I feel that this infrastructure bank is something that no doubt it is so critical and especially in a Biden Harris administration and the whole team that understand and believe that we need to invest trillions of dollars of infrastructure to upgrade the transportation system. In the case of the MTA, the signal system that allow the train to move through all this lane is so uh, old that it would take 40 years to upgrade the, the signal unless we adopt new technology, which is the plan that we have today but we need per permanent source of funding and that's what the infrastructure bank will bring. But as we heard from the representative, our issue in the Northeast is not only about to upgrade the current transportation system, it's about transportation desert area that we have in many places. In New York City from the 8.6 million people, eh, only 1.4 million individuals have vehicle. More than 7 million people rely on a public transportation. But we need to deal with a gateway. We need to be sure that we upgrade the way of how we bring more trains, Antra trains, to our pain station. It, but how, how can we get the resources that we need to build more train line in the Bronx, in Brooklyn? Someone who lives in Far Rock away it would take an hour and a half or two hours to come to Midtown Manhattan. So it's like, it's too much. I feel that this is a project that is critical and we are against the clock. But what is affecting New York City is similar as we heard, what is also happening in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Boston. This city has, and, and has, as it has been published in the New York Times, this city has seen drastic cuts 
in services, some exceeding 40% of both in rail services. So let's work together, let's get it done. And I hope that this will be embraced by the new administration. Uh, thank you very much, Councilman Rodriguez, for those words. Uh, you bring up some great points about uh, uh, the immense uh, challenges we face in front of us to be able to work on the funding that's necessary. And that's what this bank, uh, hopefully, uh, that's what it actually is designed to do. So with that being said, uh, I would remind all the uh, participants that uh, have joined us, all the attendees, uh, to uh, utilize our question and answer um, button that's on your screen. Uh, send us any questions that you might have uh, that our esteemed panelists can answer for you. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And, and with that, we're going to move on and we're going to have Representative Lamar Lemons, former uh, Representative Lamar Lemons from Michigan, uh, talk. Please, Lamar. Yes, I'm, I'm Lamar Lemons. I'm a former state representative and currently I am the chief of staff for State Senator Betty Jean Alexander. And as you see before you, state uh, we have Senate uh, Concurrent Resolution 12 introduced by uh, State Senator Betty Jean Alexander. It uh, was before we were able to get a bill number in Congress of, uh, of um, House Resolution 6422, which uh, uh, Congressman Danny Davis is the sponsor of. And we were also most recently proud to have our one of our uh, Congress uh, people, Debbie Dingell, join as a co-sponsor of the legislation. We've been working with a, a, a myriad of, of the local communities uh, to have the resolution um, adopted by their uh, local municipalities, uh, Dearborn Heights. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, we're working on one for the city of Detroit, the county of Wayne. Uh, we've had it adopted by Highland Park um, and, uh, and, and the city of Redford. And, and et cetera. Um, we all have specific needs for our municipalities. Here in Detroit, we're looking uh, for uh, funding to develop the uh, drone technology in a, um, a airport is, that is almost all but closed, and that is the Detroit City Airport, not to be confused with the Metropolitan Wayne County Airport. But the Detroit City Airport, a smaller airport, uh, we're looking to have it as a drone uh, site to fly uh, drones, and we need the infrastructure funding to have that developmental project done. We're also looking to be on the cutting edge of the uh, driverless vehicles and the technology that will be uh, uh, needed to infrastructure support for the roads and the uh, driver driverless cars, the traffic uh, signals, and our infrastructure part as we are um, our. Um, We'll be manufacturing the uh, the uh, first cars, which will not require a a driver. Um, and of course, the basic basic life giving and life saving um, resources that we need here in the area, in terms of manufacturing for uh, the PPE, as well as matter uh, that we need to bring back here to the uh, United States, which is still. Um, far too much, we're far too dependent on foreign sources for our PPE and when we have a massive unemployment here. Of course, we're most known here in one of our uh, suburbs or uh, cities that are that is not far from Detroit, the city of Flint, um, which uh, uh, we had a catastrophe um, that is uh, well renowned on the uh, poisoning through the lead, through the water system and Detroit has uh, the similar needs in terms of uh, remediation from the ar archaic water systems that we have. Um, and so we are looking uh, forward uh, to being able to access from the National Infrastructure Bank the, the resources necessary for this and a myriad of other projects with our roads, our bridges, uh, our schools, I'm also the uh, former president of the Detroit School Board and the largest school district in the state. And it too, we have um, 100 year old school buildings which are obsolete and need to be uh, retrofitted for the, or, or completely demolished and rebuilt so that, um, that we can, our children can get a 21st century education in 21st 
Century School buildings. Thank you very much, uh, Lamar, for that uh, report on what's been going on in Michigan and, and the demands uh, and how the uh, National Infrastructure Bank uh, potentially can address those concerns that you have. Uh, thank you as the questions are coming in. I do appreciate that. I've been going over them. Uh, we will answer them kind of as they come in. Uh, but uh, with that being said, I still want to make sure that everyone of our panelists gets an opportunity to be able to uh, talk and, and give a short presentation introduction on, on uh, what's going on in their region. So with that being said, I'm going to ask Representative Lisa Sebecki from Ohio, if you'd please uh, uh, unmute yourself and take it away. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to be here this evening. Um, like um, Bob said, I'm Representative Lisa Sebecki and I represent the 45th House District in the state of Ohio. And my district actually is in the Toledo area. Um, if you're familiar with our area, it's really kind of the 475 expressway up to the border and up to Michigan. But um, I'm here to report out that, as you can see here, we have in the Ohio House and 133rd General Assembly, um, a House Resolution 348 that we've introduced and our hope, would hope that we would be able to finish that before this General Assembly. But if not, we'll need to bring this resolution back again, asking for support for um, HR 6422. And, and, and honestly, when we're talking about the National Infrastructure Bank, this is a bipartisan effort to a bipartisan conversation because infrastructure is not Republican or Democrat. Infrastructure is what um, in the state of Ohio, I would like to say 11.7 million Ohioans can use. And as you could, um, have heard earlier on this evening, um, there was a converse, short conversation about the bridge in Cincinnati, the Brent, Brent Spencer Bridge. And just a little fact, a few facts here about that. It's the second busiest bridge in the United States after the George Washington Bridge, which is cross, crossing over the Hudson River. Uh, this bridge is currently out of commission. This is a bridge in the state of Ohio that has um, had what I categorize as Band-Aids, that now we're in a tourniquet, where now we're into a crisis situation that the National Infrastructure Bank could help us in the state of Ohio be able to fix our bridge once and for all and quit putting those tourniquets and small band-aids on it because it's not fared us very well. Other conversations um, that could uh, be utilized through the National Infrastructure Bank would be high-speed rail. We've had conversations to the state of Ohio of connecting, um, say for example, from Chicago to Toledo, to Cleveland, to Pennsylvania, um, and across have high-speed rail, what we used to call the T up here, uh, but the other part of that T, and I think it's probably because it's a T because it's really in the Toledo area, which would be most appropriate. But then the bottom part of that T would be going through, since, uh, going down through Columbus and over to Cincinnati and splintering out. But we could actually, through some work that we've done in our area, we could actually bring that T up through, um, up to the Detroit airport and venture off into Ann Arbor and, and to Detroit um, um, area. What this could do, this allows uh, students from say the state of Ohio to be able to go to that college up north or, like, or those students up there that, um, that up northern state as we say over here in Ohio, um, to be able to have their students be able to come to um, school here in Ohio. But it, it is also a time saving factor because uh, we do have a lot of uh, my constituents, people from the Toledo area, do go up into um, Detroit to work. And so this would um, be able to um, cut down those emissions from, from automobiles and be able to have high speed rail to move people to work and back home again. Um, some of the things that I've been doing in my area is talking with my local city council and they just recently um, passed a resolution about a month ago. Our Lucas County commissioners here 
um, are supportive of this. They've also um, passed resolution in our area. The Toledo Metropolitan Area Council of Governments have passed resolutions in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, our local union, one of them being the Plumbers and Pipefitters, Local 50, also in support of this. And also, I have spoken to colleagues across my state that I work with each and every day, Democrats and Republicans. And we've talked about some of the um, additional things that we would like to see in the state of Ohio, something that's been talked about here for a long time as well, is um, the opportunity for um, a new expressway, what, we've, what has been known in our state as I-73. Um, so this would be something that we could put on this list here for the Biden administration for their Christmas list. Uh, but the National Infrastructure Bank would fully give us those opportunities. And also, and you'll hear later on um, from my good colleague from the area, Erica White, about broadband. Something that we have learned through this pandemic is a disconnect, not only only in the state of Ohio, but across the country for broadband opportunities so that each and every one of our students um, have those opportunities to be able to connect because this is the coming of the age um, with technology. But there's pockets, not only in Ohio, but across the country that has those disconnects and you'll hear about that a little bit later on. But those are just some of the examples um, of what the work I've been doing. And I encourage um, those that are joining us, that's been joining our webinars across the time, but this could, or this could be your very first time um, joining the webinar and learning more about what the National Infrastructure Bank could do for your area, is to reach out to myself, ask how you can get involved, ask how to learn more, uh, because I think this is vitally critical and, um, and this is the time now that we uh, look at how we can actually stop the conversation about how we're gonna take care of infrastructure, but actually start getting the work done, which can put 25 million people to work immediately and which is going to actually help be that shot in the arm, um, no pun intended for what we're going through, but the antidote uh, for jobs and to keep and to be able to stimulate our economy. So with that, I thank everyone for joining us this evening and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Representative Sebecki. Uh, now, uh, Tom Carey, who's president of Westchester, Putnam County Central Labor Body, who looks like he's all decked out for the season here is our next uh, speaker. Go ahead, Tom. Happy holidays, everybody. I want to begin with uh, wishing everybody warm uh, holiday season and definitely a happier uh, new year to come. Uh, I want to welcome everybody, especially, uh, you know, my colleagues here that have been involved uh, for a long time uh, with H.R. 6422. Uh, this is a very important bill. I want to thank all of our elected officials that are here, uh, some that are actually panelists. And of course, I want to thank my brothers and sisters in labor and uh, everybody that's on this webinar this evening. This is so important. Uh, we have a fantastic Christmas gift for our president-elect Joe Biden and uh, our vice president Kamala Harris. You know, we talk about, you've already heard about many projects uh, along the way, uh, bridges, water. Uh, you know, right here in New York, we just did a $5 billion uh, Mario M. Cuomo bridge that crosses the Hudson as well. It was very important to get that bridge done. The old Tappan Zee bridge was falling apart at the seams. Uh, Governor Cuomo got in, he said, listen, we need this bridge and we made it happen. That was a major infrastructure for this area. One of the other uh, major infrastructures that, that is going on currently is our Catskill Aqueduct. Many people wonder where the water comes from in New York City. It actually starts up north about 125 miles and it's gravity fed slowly down through the counties into New York City. There is some reservoirs, there's pumping stations, uh, but many of these systems are well over hundred years old. So there's currently some ongoing work trying to repair some of these systems. Um, we talk about hospitals, we talk about educational facilities, we talk about wastewater facilities, water treatment, as I just mentioned, 
high speed rail and high speed internet, which you're going to hear about. And let's also talk about uh, our biotech industry, especially now with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, right near me, uh, right here in Westchester County, we have Regeneron, which you heard uh, the current president talking about. Regeneron is coming up with uh, a vaccine for COVID-19. So it's very imperative that our biotech uh, industry uh, gets the necessary money to continue its operations. Our nanotech, uh, our computer chip manufacturers, uh, it's very imperative that we keep up, you know, with everything going on today, uh, this bill I think would really be a positive. We need it uh, more now than ever to get this bill passed. There's so much at stake and all I could say is it, it's needed now. I don't wanna take up much time because we're gonna continue talks about uh, all of our major infrastructure needs, but we here, uh, part of the coalition, we're very excited and we're looking forward to pushing this bill forward. So I thank everybody for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, our next uh, speaker is former representative uh, Rodney Moore from North Carolina. Representative. Well, can everybody hear me? Yes, I can. Great, great. Well, well good evening. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Stuart and, and the rest of you guys for letting me uh, share a few thoughts uh, about what's going on with uh, the infrastructure needs uh, here in North Carolina. Uh, I'll start off with a little known fact that maybe some of you do know that North Carolina is the second largest highway system in the country behind Texas. And so when you have, a, when you have roads and, and, and bridges and things of that nature, you have, uh, you have some challenges. And so we have some challenges in North Carolina. I just want to kind of talk about a few of them. Uh, one of the things that we have very deficient and obsolete uh, bridges in our state that, it, that could be really be a catastrophe if one of those bridges would fall or, or something would happen on a mass scale. I, I know there was a, a bridge recently that fell in another state. Uh, prayfully, there, there was not a lot of... Uh, a uh, human cost with that, but it, it was catastrophic economically. And so we, we believe that this particular uh, bill and, and this particular action, this particular bank will help with some of our infrastructure needs here in North Carolina, uh, as far as bridges and roads that are obsolete. And we also uh, have uh, affordable housing crisis. Uh, I live here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, there is a serious affordable housing crisis because what's happened because of COVID, because of uh, jobless, job losses and other things that cities have popped up around the city of Charlotte. And uh, it's, it's just uh, for four, it's a real crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. And so 6422 could kind of help us infuse some cash into our much needed uh, try to get this affordable housing stock up so that we could kind of get those people out of uh, out of those tents and into some safe housing where they could start to rebuild their lives. Um, we also in the southeast, we, we it could really help with our uh, our high speed rail aspirations from, you know, the rail from Atlanta to Charlotte to Raleigh to Richmond to D.C it would really bring much needed uh, economic development here and would just be so much so much better as far as we move people around uh, in the Southeast region. Um, you know, we, we've been growing, the Southeast region is one of, the, one of the biggest areas in the country. And so we, we have some infrastructure issues that we need to address, especially as far as uh, environmental issues and that high speed rail would really help to address some of those some of those issues, and, and also uh, I know that Erica is going to talk about uh, broadband and, and some other issues, but we here in North Carolina, we are basically still a rural state, and so there is an issue with uh, lack of broadband access to some of our rural our rural counties and our rural counterparts, especially as it become as it relates to education and how uh, we have this new world reality 
of uh, virtual learning. And a, and a lot of our students in some of our parts of our state, uh, don't, they don't have the access or, or the availability of broadband or, or high speed uh, internet that some of, some of the others are blessed with in some of the more urban counties. And there's, there's places in our urban uh, cities like Charlotte and Raleigh that have uh, blackout areas with broadband infrastructure. And so I'm, I'm seeing that we could really benefit from the passage of this bill. I know that there is a representative who has uh, put a resolution into, uh, in, into record in the North Carolina House. I'm sure uh, that he will do it again. And, and I will c call upon you guys because I'm going to go up there and do everything I can to kind of help them push this effort through. And we talked about bipartisanship. And I've also reached out to a, a few of, of my of former Republican colleagues. I've actually burnt the ear of the speaker, a speaker more about this particular effort. And so after we get, after they formed the, uh, the, the new legislature, I, we want to go full court about, uh, about trying to get this resolution because it would create a, a whole lot of good jobs in North Carolina and it would truly help our infrastructure. And so again, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to just share those thoughts with you. And I look forward to the conversation going forward. Thank you very much, Representative. Uh, our next speaker is uh, President of CWA Local 4319, Erica White. Erica? Hello, everyone. My name is Erica White, and I'm going to, let me see, let me just save it. This is my screen. Okay, there. I'm just waiting to share my screen there. How's everyone doing tonight? So, part of, of course, I'm the most popular person, I think, here tonight, uh, <laughs> talking about broadband. Um, it's something that um, the Communication Workers of America has been very passionate about for, um, I would say, 20 years now, and making sure that what has started with um, most, we know as a telephone companies, continue to be on the top of many of legislation, the legislators list and pushing forward in Congress and the Senate. Um, and it has been a hard fight, um, but we're excited to see that is back where it belongs, uh, unfortunately, with a pandemic that did that. Um, but as we move forward, we have some pretty exciting, um, I guess we have an exciting future to go for. And I appreciate um, individuals like Representative Moore, Representative Slobecki, just to name a few that are also working with both Republicans and Democrats, because we're going to need everyone um, to push this forward. The, a lot of everything we're talking about with the National Infrastructure Bank is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. It is an issue that is truly American, um, and that's from building jobs to also improving where we are in the country. And when we do both, we make ourselves what we were, what we've always been, which is a global leader. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen again. Oh, there we go. Okay. So let me bring it up here. So a little bit what I'm going to talk about is what does that look like? What does this Christmas gift look like um, for the Biden administration that we want to pre present? So that is a two-track plan for broadband. Broadband, um, because it has been derailed and defunded and um, deflated over the last 20 years is reason why it's a two-track plan. It's going to be different for when we look at both the urban and, and rural er areas in America. And I know that you heard Representative Moore talk about that. So let me go to the next one. So the two-track two plan is going to begin first with the urban areas. Urban areas normally are, have infrastructure there, but they're underserved. So we can we're going to combine them both being underserved and also urban and bring them together. So what we need to do is expand and use existing infrastructure. Um, and I put nor, sorry, but supposed to be not building back or building forward. And let me explain that just a little bit um, pretty quickly without boring you with a bunch of nerd terms, what I do. So um, I actually am an outside plant engineer, and this is part of what I did was design. Um, what I'm talking about is not building back is that most of what the infrastructure or what you see hanging in the air, the copper cable has not been maintained. So part of the money that we're talking about in the infrastructure bank, we don't want to build back. We want to build forward, build better. We don't want to go back and try to capture this plant or this cable out there that is deteriorating and dying, as Representative Moore said because those areas don't have anything. So even in the urban areas where the infrastructure exists, 
we don't want to go back and encourage the companies that already have the infrastructure there, like AT&T and Verizon, to fix. We want to give them money to fix. We want to have them invest in money in building forward and building better. So that's something that's very important that everyone understands that not to have companies fix, they need to do that. In other words, that's their responsibility. We want them to expand and use existing infrastructure to build forward so that those urban areas and underserved areas are actually getting what they're supposed to already have. So just to give you a little example, I'm sure when you ride around areas, you'll see, um, and the best way I can use is AT&T or Verizon, these little buildings that sit all around the city. Those are what we call central offices or where some of our switching equipment is. Well, a lot of those have been pulled, all the equipment has been pulled out or we've updated it, but we haven't had the money or that to update those areas so that what is happening is urban areas are now underserved where they're not even meeting the minimum or we just haven't had um, the manpower to do that. So what we're talking about is that two track plan beginning in urban areas to work with unions, Communication Works of America, because that's what we do, um, and making sure that the companies that should have been already investing, what we've been asking them to do with our broadband bills, that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. By not only are we expanding that broadband there, but we're also providing jobs in the communities that have lost. I would ask you, how many people do you know that work for the phone company? You probably don't know very many. They're still there. But when we expand and we bring those jobs home and we make sure that we're investing in our community, to be an outside plant engineer, for example, that's a skilled trade. And when we talk about skilled trades, I just want to throw that in a little bit. They make more money than someone with a degree at some, at some points. And that is what we want to talk about is why skilled trades are just as valuable as having a degree. Because you can't go to school to learn about telephony engineering. You have to work there. So we want to continue to invest. Now, the other part is the rural areas. And rural has, a, has limited to no infrastructure. So if we look at the Allegheny Mountains, if we look at desert regions where people do live, um, there's very hard to get infrastructure there. Um, also, when we talk about submarine cable and um, getting across lakes or oceans and things, that is very difficult and is very costly. So when we're talking about even building out rural areas, we will build to what I would call the end of a square. And it's the best thing I use. I don't know if you can see this book. We're going to go about, I'm not going to show here, but maybe your house is to the end of my screen. We're calling at the last 30,000 feet. We're not going to get to you. Because first of all, it, re it requires a lot of repeaters. The signal can only go so far. There's a lot of issues when we're even to building out to people in rural areas. So that's why we have to use a mix of broadband. And that's going to include using copper and fiber and satellite because we've got to figure out, even if we get it there, how can we keep the signal high enough that it's going to be usable? So that's really nice that we got a line out to your house. Doesn't it still have to work? So that's where we're going to have to work a lot at figuring out when we're looking at different topo um, geographic areas, what works in those areas so that we're not just building something there that still doesn't work. Let me go to the next thing. So the two-track plan, this is what we're at, where there is no company, we're going to have to work with, and, and of course, that would be, um, we're hoping that it'll be um, people like CWA that already have that background will work with developing um, municipal providers. How do we help municipalities where they don't even understand what a central office is, where they don't understand what capacity is or interference, and how do we build that, where they have to understand what spectra is, even words that you're like, huh? Yeah, well, most people wonder that. <laughs> That's things that I am taught to know. I, I actually, as a skilled trade person, that I understand very well. But we've got to make sure people understand it. Just because we say we want broadband, we build broadband, it, it requires a little bit of math, a little science, <laughs> a little more than that, okay? And if there is existing municipality authority, um, we want to make sure, let me my thing over, that we use the outermost office. Remember, I showed you the book going to the end. We've got to build that out. What does that look like? And so we're very excited. That's where we've got to begin at. So we know things are there. We know companies are there. If they're there, we need to work with them, use them. But if they're not there, then we need to have the idea and be ready to move with municipalities on building that. So that means that we're also more than likely increase from 80 billion to 100 billion because here's one thing that I want everyone to understand. Technology changes every three to five years. 
copper's already old, y'all. I know. I mean, you might be shocked, okay? <laughs> I mean, and then, and then fiber is old too. So copper is really old, and fiber is now old too. We don't know. Think about this: what the technology may be the next three to five years from now. So we have to also build that into our broadband plan because think about that. We build something now and think about it being three to five years out and it's outdated. So we have to be very cognizant as we're building broadband that we're not all excited and we're building something that doesn't have the capacity for growth. And so I'm very excited about that. We do want to make sure that we keep in mind it has to be a two track system that serves both the urban underserved areas and the rural undeveloped areas. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Erica. Uh, our next speaker is Jack Hanna, uh, who's from Portland, Oregon, with ties to Pennsylvania. So, Jack, it's up to you. Oh, thank you very much, Bob. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm going to provide um, a political perspective to this issue with regard to a national infrastructure bank. Uh, what is the current situation politically? I think it's fair to describe, and most of you will agree, it's political gridlock. And given the elections that occurred last month, um, despite our having a change in uh, a pending change with regard to the White House, uh, the House is going to be less than, uh, uh, will be only a single digit margin between uh, the number of Democrats and Republicans that serve there. The situation in the Senate, exactly the same. Regardless of what happens in Georgia next month, there's going to be one or two votes that's the difference between one party's control and the other. Now, what is the current situation economically? Uh, we now have 7% unemployment, and that's really not an accurate reflection of what those numbers are because more and more people are dropping out of the workforce and thereby not being reflected in that number. We have 3.3 million, many of them not coming back. Uh, the uh, statistics uh, uh, are presuming, assuming that up to 40% of those employees that have lost their job are going to be long-term permanently unemployed. We have 1.1 million local and state government employees having lost their jobs uh, and more to come uh, once uh, the budgets that are shrinking um, as a result of the slowed economic uh, uh, circumstances that we have uh, facing uh, their uh, budget balancing obligations in many states. We have a housing and eviction crisis that's going to hit uh, by the end of January, the consequences of which uh, we're still trying to grasp and understand the severity of. We have a hunger and food crisis whereby one in six households with children didn't have enough food last week to eat. We have an entertainment industry, our hotels, restaurants, and uh, airlines uh, uh, that will partially recover, but only a percentage of what they were before. Just witness Disney uh, last week laying off 32,000 employees. Given these two circumstances, what may be done that's feasible politically and substantive policy-wise to turn this ship around. And our country, just three days ago, the Wall Street Journal writer, Gerald Sieb asked the same question. Is there any issue we can turn to with the hope of being us uh, working together on a common task. His answer was, quote, one word, infrastructure. Infrastructure development is something that has been talked about for many years, especially since 2018 elections when the House became under the control of the Democrats 
and the Senate still retained by the Republicans. Um, uh, what um, a common effort by both parties means is that um, uh, a national infrastructure bank that is approved and created uh, by our government will, first of all, create no new national debt and thereby avoids concerns uh, about our increased budget deficits uh, that are a challenge as far as our government is concerned. Um, its economic impact will uh, improve uh, uh, our communities and states and locales across the board by providing living wages uh, and jobs that uh, are uh, needed as far as economic uh, efficiencies are concerned, broadband, high-speed rail, roads, bridges, water and sewage projects, all of which have been uh, described earlier. And uh, in addition, other speakers will uh, be talking about after me. And these kind of economic developments and projects are something that will resonate with the public. They know, and we know, that these are necessary tasks that we must accomplish in order to improve our communities, not only uh, uh, through employment, but also uh, uh, economic efficiency. The infrastructure projects can be equally spread over both red states and blue states with uh, legislation that properly addresses those concerns. It can be shaped in a way that equally provides benefits and improvements to our urban areas and our rural ones. Uh, we just need the political will and the vision by our public officials, both Democrats and Republicans to accomplish this task. The program for the National Infrastructure Bank may be constructed in a way that benefits all people and the public at large where everybody gets a piece of the pie. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jack, for those words and the layout or the lay of the land as we're looking forward to it. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Rudy Arandondo, who is president of the National Latino Farmers and Ranchers Trade Association. Rudy? Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you very much to uh, all of you folks that are joining us. Uh, you know, my, my work is uh, uh, mostly in rural communities, uh, although we do have some uh, farmers markets in which our uh, farmers uh, are able to uh, sell their products. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm also part of the National uh, uh, Infrastructure uh, Bank Coalition. And uh, the first time I think that we are the first uh, uh, NGO to endorse this concept. When it first was brought to me by Stuart and Angela, I saw that it's the only means by which we are able to kickstart our economy. I've seen the deterioration of the infrastructure in rural America, the uh, deterioration also of political influence because everybody is in, in a public office it required the amenities, essential uh, broadband, uh, good telephone service, etc. So we are concerned with the deterioration of the uh, bridges, roads. Uh, you know, our family uh, has uh, seven small family farms in northwestern Ohio, in the uh, Fulton, uh, Henry, Williams uh, counties in in uh, northwest uh, uh, Ohio. And we also have, uh, you know, work with folks in uh, Michigan. And I, I did a, a Illinois, Ohio, Indiana a trip uh, about a year ago. And I, I mean, the infrastructure was horrible. I mean, the interstates, there was, uh, it was potholes, et cetera, which is, was incredible for me. I hadn't been there for a while. But the other thing that we're concerned about is the fact that you have closure uh, of rural hospitals. Uh, you have the clinics that are oversubscribed. 
and not enough resources to operate and provide the essential, uh, you know, health care that is needed by our uh, rural communities. The closure of the community colleges where some of our folks needed to go in order to be able to obtain uh, broadband access. And uh, Erica, thank you so much for bringing that proposal. You know, we're working with charter communication. We're trying to work with T-Mobile in terms of uh, the, your private public uh, partnership in order to be able to get uh, in, uh, you know, a rural broadband to our communities. Now the, the schools are closing. And so we need to kickstart our, our, our uh, you, you know, our economy. And I see the National Infrastructure Bank as the only uh, answer to those concerns. So thank you very much to everybody for uh, being on this call. And uh, we need to be bold, and especially those of you who are who are uh, holding pu public office. I really appreciate your your uh, en endorsements and your work because it, it's it's essential. And to my brothers and sisters in the uh, labor unions, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, our final uh, presenter today is uh, Stan Forzek. Uh, once again, I want to remind you. Uh, to please keep your questions coming. Uh, we're ready to start answering them here as soon as uh, Stan gets done. In fact, Stan's probably going to take one or two of them after he makes his initial presentation. So Stan, you're up. Uh, thanks. I appreciate that, Bob. Uh, I have a couple things to say, and I have to say thank you to Jack uh, for uh, elaborating on everything that he envisions or has seen throughout the last several months and where he sees things going. I, I think that was an excellent dissertation. Thank you so much, Jack. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I wanted to speak about was very simply the fact that we all know that the National Infrastructure Bank is poised to eliminate the appropriations process that everyone goes through because there is no money and we're really not getting anything done. So in, in essence, it's taking the place uh, of that appropriations process and being able to finance and fund all of the projects throughout the United States. And Alpeca did a great job of pointing out those projects which are uh, shovel ready, but we need more and we're gonna get those things. But one thing I wanted to say uh, is the fact that the bank isn't just a bank. The bank is more than just financing different projects for infrastructure. The bank has an entirely different section to it, all right? Uh, and I know some people have questions on this. There's also an advising engineering section that would be a part of the bank so that projects could be integrated so that those individuals or those municipality, these municipalities that don't have engineering folks on board or need an advising consultant to help them build a project that can be presented to the bank, the bank is gonna have that engineering section within its confines so that people will be able to ask for the money with a full blown project that's integrated with other projects and actually complete a first class overall project that could be uh, an example for all the people within that area. I envision also a regulatory section, a different part of uh, uh, financing whereby the bank can review uh, all regulatory uh, 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 legislation that comes out that forces project managers to change their projects. And this particular section will also work with those regulatory bodies to make sure that there aren't too many regulations, that we don't get stymied as we move forward. I think that that's one process that has hindered infrastructure development throughout the last 10, 15, 20 years where there are too many regulations. So the bank's gonna have that particular section. The bank is also going to act as a clearinghouse for all possible state, interstate, and national projects. 
you would be surprised. Uh, members of the coalition have gone to different states to talk to different people regarding, let's just take a rail project that goes over bridges that those individuals who are in transportation cannot figure out who owns the bridge that has to be repaired. And it's in every state, it's in every locale, because there's so many bridges that go over gullies and everything like that. No one knows who they, who they belong to, whose property records there are. So the bank is going to develop those property records so we can advise people coming in to develop projects. This is not your bridge, but it doesn't seem to be that person's bridge. Someone's got to assume authority over it and it gets that particular job done. It's also going to be a clearinghouse for technology. Uh, I, I think it's important, as Erica said, technology changes every three to five years, all right? I happen to be watching uh, a, a video that Placer put out for a track laying system for putting in uh, rail systems that completely changes the idea of what we started in Amtrak 30 years ago. And now you could lay track at a mile and a quarter in a work day and only use four people. And I think that type of technology has to be recorded. It has to be researched and it, we have to have a uh, database to do everything like that. Another thing that's gonna happen is we need an energy, an engineering procurement section, all right? Those individuals who can advise and act on what's needed for what project. Erica says we need a different, a different type uh, of uh, format to transfer the broadband back and forth. Other people will say, well, we should have uh, 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 piping when we put in our water uh, distribution systems. And an engineering procurement uh, a section will look at all of the projects across the nation. And we will see that there are economies of scale to go out and maybe get the broadband materials in Ohio, but get them for other states at the exact same time, because everything's gonna be a mirror image, or in most cases is gonna be. The same with piping, the same with stick rail for high-speed rail, the same with everything that's out there. We start looking at projects and right away we can see that through economies of scale, the projects are not $50 million anymore. They've gone down to 48.5. And we keep on doing things like that and we get more done uh, for the money that we're putting out. And that's less money that the municipalities, the states and the cities have to pay. So it's important. And then the last thing that the bank, the other side of the bank has to work on we know that we're gonna hire 25 million people to get these projects done. Well, at some particular point of time, three years, five years, 10 years, some of these projects are gonna be finished. And you're gonna be sitting there and you're gonna have a lot of these project workers that are going to have to be retrained to actually perform the maintenance function on the projects that put in a new bridge or put in a new roadway. So you're going to need more maintenance people. So you're going to have to retool and retrain those people. So there will be an HR retraining section in those things, in, in the bank itself. So I want you to bear that in mind. Last point, several of us have made the issue of this is a bipartisan bill. It is not Democratic. It is not Republican. It is for the good of the nation. There is not a citizen in this country who will not benefit from a national infrastructure bank. Everybody will. Every generation that comes after us will. We're getting ready for the 22nd century and we're gonna start now. We're gonna get this bill approved and we're gonna move forward and we're gonna take ourselves to the 22nd century. I'm tired of talking about we're living in a world with 18th century infrastructure. No, we got to get to the 22nd century. Thanks so much for everybody joining in. We're going to have some questions and answers. And I hope everybody will help Alfeca out by providing some more shovel-ready projects 
topics that we can get moving on and, and use as we debate HR 6422. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Stan. Uh, with that being said, Elfeka, you are the one of the more popular uh, people when it comes to the questions that they're asking. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put a couple out to you here so that you can explain. Uh, one of the questions is, what's the approximate number of jobs that the plan will create, and what's the estimated amount of money that will be paid back into the system by those employed on these jobs per year? For every billion uh, uh, dollars you spend on infrastructure, you create uh, approximately uh, 15,000 jobs or something like that. We have kind of these ratios and we've actually put them on the table. Some are uh, some kind of some kinds of work create more uh, jobs than others. Uh, in particular, even though Stan gave an example of rail and a, a machine that lays down track, you have to come along with crews after that to do something with the stones and something with the other. Yeah, it, rail, is, rail construction is quite labor intensive. Uh, so is new, putting in new water infrastructure and so are anything to do with rail and roads are quite uh, uh, labor intensive. Uh, so all those kinds of jobs which are very high on our list will create millions and millions of jobs. Um, what we do is we'll focus on getting a full list of all the projects we want to cover right away and then we'll look at the, uh, the, the whether that's uh, give, getting us enough to our jobs target to fill uh, this economic void that we're in on account of the recession and put people back to work quickly. That's going to be a, a higher, the highest priority projects will be the ones that will create a lot of jobs, that's for sure. Then the second point is uh, how much does this plow back into the economy? Uh, the overall effect is for every dollar you spend on infrastructure, you plow back into the economy three to, three to seven dollars over the long run. That's both in uh, direct uh, economic uh, implications from the construction and the manufacturing that inputs into the construction, and then the indirect uh, effects on the economy as those workers respend their money and go out and buy, um, you know, uh, hospitality services or any other kind of services uh, or um, consumer goods that they that that they desire to buy. So there's there's multipliers for all of that. And all of it is run through some models at the University of Maryland to show the different effects of transportation, um, um, investment, uh, investment in the electric grid, investment in uh, water infrastructure. And you can see those economic effects on some reports from the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you Google ASCII failure to act series, you'll see the reports pop up and they'll show you the economic uh, effects that have that have been run through that through these economic models. Thank you, Alfeca. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, a number of our uh, politicians to comment on this question. How do we convince the states, the DOT, to take as what shovel ready project or near ready projects off the shelf and have them funding uh, ready in anticipation of the NIB being established? Lisa, if you wouldn't mind uh, talking about how, how do we get uh, our Department of Transportations and, and that to start to take on these projects. And then I'm gonna ask the same thing of you, uh, Rep. Joe Ceresi. Go Lisa. Well, well, really it's having the conversation with them about what those shovel ready projects are and how we can go about getting them accomplished. So it's really just, it's relationships. And you know that's something that I've been doing with within the state of Ohio here locally or with my colleagues across the state. Uh, because this is where we have to have relationships on what those projects are in our areas and where those critical needs are. It's something that happened in, our, in the state of Ohio when I first came on as a legislator, my freshman legislator finishing up my first term, was in our districts, our Ohio Department of Transportation folks lot of, gave us a report that reported what the conditions of our bridges and our streets, uh, our highways were um, within our areas and what need to be looked at for that infrastructure. And something that I was really shocked about is a bridge that I cross over every day um, was an F rated bridge. So really in the state of F rated means failing. It's a failing bridge and it, it need, it's a critical need, needs to be taken care of. And on this report, it let us know how long it's been in this condition. 
And I talked a little bit earlier about we need to take, you know, stop putting those. Well, what we do here in the state of Ohio is we put little band-aids on and now we're in those tourniquet crisis needs that they're almost past the tourniquet time frame. So this is why it's mostly important. It's really important that we get the NIV and get these jobs done. But, but with that report though, it also talked about how long it's been in that rating. So this particular bridge that I'm talking about, it's been an F rating for the past eight years. So we've known for eight years that this needs to take care of. Well, that's, you know, that's a long time um, for us not to be able to uh, take care of the needs within our state. So that's just one small example. But um, I would go back to really what I started off with is relationships and understanding the importance. And I think in the Ohio, our Ohio Department of Transportation really does have a, a, a grasp on um, what those immediate needs are on fixes. So I think in a lot of ways, you'll find your states um, already know that. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Representative Joe Ceresi. Well, thank you very much. And, and like Lisa said, you know, our state departments of transportation are raring to do these projects. Um, we know in Pennsylvania, like you have the F-rated bridges, we've seen what we call the deficient bridges across the Commonwealth and know for years that they need to be worked on. And some of them have been closed. I have one about 15 minutes from me that's been closed for, I think, 10 years because we don't have the money to be able to replace it, which has caused the traffic nightmare in the community that it's in. Um, and we're hearing it from our fire companies who have no access to certain areas when there is an accident. It takes an extra four or five minutes to get to the scene, which we all know four or five minutes can be a life-changing time. So I think if we're able to get this bank going, if we're able to get the money flowing to the states, our Department of Transportation will be all over this. They'll have hundreds of projects and they do have them. When you go, when I met with them, when I started two years ago, they showed me everything they have in the hopper. And they said, this is how much money we need in the budget this year. And I have two colleagues who are on this call with us who are observing, uh, Representative Daly and Representative Paczynski. And I'm sure they would agree with me that if we had the money, we would fund every one of these projects. Pennsylvania has some of the largest highway systems in the nation throughout the Commonwealth. And you don't realize it because some of it is in rural areas, but we're a very, very big state. So we have a lot of roads to take care of. Uh, we run at a deficit with our, uh, our Turnpike Authority, which is a big deal for us because we need that money for infrastructure. But like I brought up before, the taxes that we had from the gas tax with people driving less with hybrid cars and with taking money out of that fund and putting it elsewhere has caused our Department of, Mot uh, Department of Transportation to have to cut their spending. So if we had this bank where we can go back to it and get this money, our Department of Transportation would be all over it. You'd see brand new bridges and roads everywhere. And thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Rodriguez, uh, somebody on here asked, uh, what is the Gateway Project? If you could kind of uh, explain that a, a touch. And then also, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, they want to know uh, if, if the bank goes, it's basically a lending institute and they give you the money, how are you going to pay? How is the city and how are the state going to pay back these dollars? So if you could try and take a stab at that, that'd be great. Well, I'm sorry, I got the first part. What is the second one? Uh, basically, uh, after you tell us what the Gateway Project is, how, how would the city be able to pay back the loans that they get from the National Infrastructure Bank? What, what, what do you see? How would we be able to make that happen? I have an idea, but I, I think you do too. So, so far, as you know, the, the Gateway Project will allow the city to build another tunnel from where more trains, they will be able to come uh, to our uh, Penn Station. Uh, this project being led by Congressman Nadler and also Senator Schumer. Uh, the last uh, commitment uh, that the federal government made was related to uh, the current president putting a Twitter that he was adding a couple of billion dollars to complete the funding of this project. So far, the project has been seen as mainly contribution of a, a federal government. And, and that's a, the, the most important contribution. And, and, and I think that 
the question will be, what is the business structure that will be in, in guidance, the infrastructure bank? Because everything is gonna be about how much revenue the new project will generate so that the city, the state, the public and private sector will be able to be in a better position. And in this case, as you know, the train system, including the MTA, is an independent uh, entity. E even though it's led by Governor Cuomo, in this case of the MTA, uh, to appoint the chair, but they are independent entity where we have the, the contribution of the state, the city, and the federal. There have been some new ideas, like I've been speaking to some professor at NYU, who they believe that we should also create a transportation, a, like, like we have the business improvement system, that we should have a transportation improvement system, where also the, those individuals who own million or square of property, a, they should also contribute funding to, trans, to transportation. I, be, I believe that when it comes to, in, the challenges that I see that we have right now is now lacking project. It's about permanent source of funding. Like here in New York City, there's a, every year, let's say I can give you an example. The New York City Council passed a bill and we were trying to negotiate with Major de Blasio to have a plan to build 100 protected a bike lane every year for the next four years. But there's not enough funding to accomplish that goal. And we were only building 28. That was a higher number that we got every year. So there's idea that I've been leading, trying sending a letter to the NTA, NTA to build a new shuttle train. In this case, in the uptown area of Manhattan, connecting A train, Metro North, D train, four train. So that's whoever living in, in in, in Westchester and they take the Metro North instead of going to 42nd Street to be able to say, if I work in New York private stadium, if I work in this part in the North Pine on, on, the, on Manhattan, I should be able to connect in the Metro North stop in this area and be able to use that shuttle train. So I feel that what happening here in New York City I, is similar what I believe based on conversation that we have with previous colleagues in all the city in LA, it's not lacking of project. It's about the understanding that investing in infrastructure is the best way of how we can take this nation to the new level. Like MTA is not important only for New York City. You can be Democrat or Republican, but if you want to attract people to work in a private company and you sell them that they will be living in a city with the best transportation system, so this is not just about important for those in government. It's about for those uh, who also uh, uh, had a hedge fund. And uh, even though people like us and many of us, we just want to connect more individuals, regardless where they live, to mass public transportation. And that's something that in the case of the city, and I'm sure that this is a nationwide challenges. As I mentioned, we're so lucky if we live in Manhattan because we have all those train lanes in Manhattan. But if you live in the South Bronx, if you live in Brooklyn, and if you are one of those teachers who after coming back from all these places, you had a big heart to serve in the underserved community, and you need to walk 15 blocks from a train station to your school, there's something that we're lacking on transportation. And again, and those are the same challenges that I know we face in LA, we face in San Antonio, we face in Texas and other places. Thank you, uh, Congress or Councilman. Uh, next, uh, Stan, uh, I've, I've got three questions here that, that kind of I think you can address a little bit. Uh, one, they want to know what high speed rail projects are ready to go or in the process. And, and I know you've talked a lot about the electrical grid, and somebody asked, uh, we need the, the electrical grid totally unitized and and uh, utilized around the U.S. to connect both solar and wind energy? And is, uh, are the electric charging stations considered to be a transportation infrastructure project? I'll take the, first, the last one first, and I would say yes, that the charging stations are an infrastructure project. There are, people, there are uh, different places putting it in, in already, but uh, some people, again, don't, just don't have the money 
it is an infrastructure project. The electric grid, insofar as the movement of capacity along the transmission lines, does contain the ability to uh, uh, take uh, solar or wind power or sustainable power and move it back and forth. I will say this, there, uh, as far as transportation is concerned, uh, Germany, who was one of the, one of the forerunners for high-speed rail, uh, actually has now said that the cost of sustainable energy across the transmission lines to feed the railroad is too costly and they're re removing uh, sustainable energy from the capacity needs of high-speed rail. So that's something to think about. But the United States, it can be moved back and forth and, and utilized. Uh, you've got the one project off of uh, the coast of New Jersey and Delaware that's going to feed into uh, three points uh, at the Jersey Shore, and the substations are being put in now. Uh, I think Governor Murphy has, has signed on uh, for, the all, for all the interconnection agreements to be done, and the PJM is going to take that power and move it westward. So the, all of those things are being prepared and being worked on. And Bob, could you repeat the first question? Uh, what other high speed uh, railroad projects are, are ready to move forward? Well, I think there's a, a, a number of them, uh, all right? You, you've got people in Florida that, that are working on uh, high speed rail. Uh, you've got the, the new uh, act that was put out today by Seth Bolton and his folks. Uh, and, and there's a whole list of rail projects in there. And there's a lot of projects uh, as uh, um, Representative Lisa has, has, has mentioned, uh, the, the, the people in Chicagoland want to go uh, eastward into Indiana, Ohio, and uh, definitely into Pennsylvania. And uh, two weeks ago on our webinar, we had someone from the Pittsburgh Council talk about going from Harrisburg uh, out to Pittsburgh. Uh, those are big jobs. And, and, and also within Pennsylvania, and I, I know uh, Representative Cerisi mentioned, mentioned Montgomery County and the old Reading line, which should have never uh, been disbanded, but was because the Reading line went all the way to the New Jersey shore, and now there's nothing. But anyway, you also have the idea and Amtrak has put out a publication to uh, add service coming out of New York City into Scranton, to Easton, to Bethlehem, to Allentown, out to Harrisburg. So there's a lot of different areas. The only, the only thing I see is some of the planning people who are working on these projects are working with the idea of should I or should I know, uh, should I not? put it in as electric traction service. Uh, and my only recommendation is it should be electric. You really don't want to put in a diesel high-speed rail. Uh, first off, they're only going to go 90 miles an hour, but they're going to just create more and more pollution. We need to get away from that. And that's why you want to start thinking about uh, uh, electric traction. I think that makes the most sense. I hope I answered those questions for you. Thanks, Stan. Uh, Tom? Uh, there's a couple of questions on here that I think you can uh, uh, talk about. One, uh, uh, can the NIB be used to build uh, vocational uh, programs in high schools? And how is a, an apprenticeship program work with it? And what types of wages are we talking about uh, that the bank is proposing here? Hey, thanks, jo thanks, Bob. Yeah, I, you know, we, we talk about apprenticeship. That's the one good thing that's that's involved in this bill is that it talks about apprenticeship uh, languages, approved apprenticeship programs. Uh, many of our vocational schools, we have a lot of tech schools here in Westchester County. And what happens is a lot of kids, you're either going off to college or some kids uh, will get directed towards a vocational school, whether it's HVAC, uh, car mechanics, electrical, uh, carpentry, you have it. Um, but what we try to do is we try to get these kids pointed in the direction of an apprenticeship program because the wages are so good. 
you know, a kid could start off uh, right out of high school, make it eleven dollars an hour and move up rather quickly through the apprenticeship program. Uh, I believe the NIB, that money would be there to help out any one of these apprenticeship programs and uh, most definitely, you know, help out the schools. You know, I talked about vocational uh, facilities being built. You know, a lot of these old, the one that I uh, went to in my area is an old building. It needs to be refurbished. Uh, you know, especially with the new technology coming out nowadays, a lot of these old vocational schools need to be, you know, from ground up, they need to be fixed. So I hope that answers the question, Bob. Uh, thanks for that. Um, next, uh, we're going to uh, Rudy. I have several questions on here. They're talking about uh, uh, what can be done uh, uh, in reservation areas, uh, Navajo reservations or out in the um, Southwest, when we're talking about uh, how could the bank uh, be able to uh, help uh, the res uh, the Indian Nation and also uh, Southwest uh, the United States? Uh, well, I saw you know the tribes being uh, uh, sovereign nations. Uh, one of the things that I know, we, you know, Anthony is already doing this in terms of uh, working with the tribal council to ensure that what are their priorities. I mean, what are their priorities in terms of trying to bring uh, infrastructure into their uh, tribal lands? Uh, so that's, that's the first step in terms of making sure that we don't, uh, from the outside, try to impose something that may not be workable for them. Uh, so that would be my first uh, is a consultation. And I know that, uh, you know, the NIB team is available to explain to the uh, tribal council uh, to, as to how this is gonna work and, and try to fit it within their, their uh, uh, priorities. So that would be my answer with regard to that. Uh, I know they have a tremendous need for certainly broadband health services. I used to work with the community health center. So I used to uh, work with the Indian health services so they have a tremendous need, and particularly, you know, uh, in terms of food production, do they have land that can that we can be able? To, if we, because one of the things that we found out with working with the tribes is that some of them have lost their ability to to uh, uh, cultivate land. They've lost that skill. Uh, so that that's a part of uh, being able to have these apprenticeship program programs that we might be able to adapt to the tribal uh, culture. Uh, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Rudy. Um, this question, the next question is uh, for Sandra and for Jack. Um, do you know any of the senior Biden administration in order to get real answers on their ideas to begin the national or the large meaningful national infrastructure project funding uh, move forward? And, and what are you kind of doing that? And the, the one thing they asked, uh, do you know if there's any, uh, uh, it seems to be a lack of construction professionals uh, in, in the administration at the moment. Just wondering what you can tell us about the Biden transition team and, and your conversation with that. Uh, Sandra, if you would go first, please. Well, knowing people in leadership, we're attempting to get to them constantly. Uh, so, um, I would say, uh, I don't know how to answer the question. It's a continuous process. That's my answer to that part. We are <laughs> attempting it every day as, many, uh, as much as we possibly can. We've made some inroads, as I indicated to you earlier. We have a lot of others that we have attempted and we're waiting answers on. Um, uh, I can't give you answers any more than that. How about you, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let, let me add uh, this, uh, Sandra. Uh, the Biden transition team uh, that approached us was a combination of transportation and commerce, and uh, uh, I think also interior. And so uh, they're taking a, a broad look at attacking the issue of infrastructure generally. As far as the technical uh, people uh, that are involved or not involved, I think that's something that's going to emerge 
and be rolled out a little bit later than this. Um, uh, they're just getting oriented as far as their policies and priorities are concerned at the moment. But let me just also add, uh, there was a comment in, the, in a question in the, uh, uh, the Q&A portion about uh, how uh, are the programs gonna be implemented and, uh, uh, and who are they going to serve? Uh, it's going to be, uh, in order for this legislation to be passed, there's going to be some sausage making. That's yep. an absolute yep. necessity. Yep. And the sausage making is going to be um, the proof of the pudding as far as equal access to uh, all different types of communities, urban and rural, red and blue states. Um, finally, the um, legislation is crafted in a way that it serves communities that need, uh, uh, that face economic challenges throughout the entire country. So it first and foremost uh, uh, provides, I believe something like about 20% uh, of the funding to go to areas that are uh, in dire straits economically. So it's going to be a balancing act. Uh, the Biden administration is getting up to speed as to how to attack this issue. And uh, we are encouraged thus far uh, with their attempts to do so. And we think that the, nests, the economic circumstances that we face at the moment require them and all politicos from both parties to face this serious issue. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> we're getting close here to, to wrapping it up. And, and, and I know we didn't get to every question that's on here. Uh, some of the questions or our answers to your questions are actually on our website. If you were to go to our website and, and uh, uh, go through um, the quick summary and some of the uh, Q, uh, we have frequently asked questions. A number of the questions you're asking are already described on there. And it's, uh, it's written out in great detail. So I would encourage you after the, after the conclusion of this is to go and, and visit our website. That's www.nibcoalition.org um, or .com, I'm sorry. Uh, and make sure that uh, uh, when you do that, um, uh, that you explore the website. There's other webinars that go into great detail about, about the history of it and, and some of the other things. With that being said, I would like to ask uh, two more uh, of our uh, panelists to kind of uh, give us a comment on this. Uh, <clears throat> Rodney uh, from North Carolina, if you would, uh, I, I know you're, you, you're, you've been instrumental in trying to get the resolutions passed. What do you think is, is something that all of us on this, this call could do to be able to uh, reach out to uh, other people to be able to encourage them to get involved? Well, uh, I believe it's been said over and over again, by, uh, uh, Bob, about relationships. You have to have relationships across both sides of the aisle. As people have referenced uh, during this uh, particular webinar, it's not about uh, Democrat or Republican. This is an infrastructure issue, and it benefits all of our citizens, no matter what your party affiliation or, or otherwise. And so I think it was just, first of all, you have to really believe in the National Infrastructure Bank. You have to believe it because when you talk to people about it, they, under, they, they believe it because you believe it and they get excited because you're excited. And so that makes it a whole lot easier to talk about the technical issues and build those relationships. And so I would just say to really just educate ourselves about every facet of the infrastructure uh, industry and to, uh, and to build those relationships, keep, keep pushing, you know, you know, in sales, you know, you don't get the sale the first time, you know, so it, it takes two, three, four, five uh, outreaches to really get to that point where you're going to, where you're going to close that deal. And so I would say, just don't get discouraged, be diligent and uh, believe in what you're doing and just keep building those relationships and pushing that uphill. So that, that would be my comment. Very good. Thank you for that. And, and Erica, I'm going to kind of give you uh, the one last chance to kind of hit this out of the ballpark, give us a wrap up of why you believe the National Infrastructure Bank is what's necessary for us to be able to move America forward. One of the most important parts as we look at job creation and job development, that's the number one thing where we are in our economy right now. We have still 
and I'm not gonna remember who said it from the beginning when we talked about the unemployment numbers. I think that was Jack that talked about that. And I can tell you from a labor perspective, from someone in the community that we're all experiencing that, what that actually looks like and feels like. And then when people don't have jobs, they also, we notice things go up as far as racism. Another thing that increases is we know people don't have access to healthcare. That's still a big issue during this pandemic. So supporting National Infrastructure Bank, we can talk, everyone gets that we're, we're talking about improving our infrastructure. We also wanna talk about improving our communities. And if you're here and you're alive, which I think everyone is, right? You understand the connections that we're talking about to each other as people and to our community, to our families and to the next generation. Reason why I believe in this is not just also building my community where I live at, but also knowing that the next generation is coming behind us. And the one thing we have a commitment to and is biblical <laughs> and is also the foundation of where we are in this country is we're supposed to leave things better than what we found it. We're not supposed to use up all the resources. We're not supposed to destroy the land which we were gifted from God. And so one of the things we have to do is we have to leave this country better than what we found it. And the reason we, the way that we do that is National Infrastructure Bank. We have to make sure that the next generation has access to jobs and skilled trades. And that happens through the National Infrastructure Bank. We have to also make sure that we, we live in safe communities where our bridges aren't falling apart, right? <laughs> where there's potholes that are destroying people's cars. And we're also not only creating direct jobs, but also indirect jobs. And that's how we move America, continue to move America forward, not only here at home, but as a global entity. And that is one of the biggest reasons that I support the National Infrastructure Bank. It's what we need, is what we believe in as Americans and as workers in America. So just please continue to pass the word. People understand as, as um, Bob, I love that, he said, the number one social program in this country is a J-O-B. So <laughs> yeah. that's the, we are support for anything. <laughs> and, some, and, and remember that what's going on in Flint, if I can express anything, the city of Flint still has not solved their water, water crisis. So when we talk about what's going on, let's remember that, that we have a chance not just to build bridges and improve broadband, but to really change people's lives. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very so much for that, uh, uh, Bobby, Erica. If I, if Go I, ahead. I just wanted to uh, uh, ask uh, Jack, you know, uh, your, uh, your governor, Kate Brown, is the chair of the Western Governors Association. I was, uh, you know, they had their, their winter meeting today and they had resolutions, but I don't, since I was, I was busy with three, Zoom calls today. I was unable to reach them. So, but if you if you re can reach out to her and find out whether because this is something they have they've been complaining about not having sufficient resources to deal with uh, fire suppression as the wildfires and and uh, not only in 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 California and in in, in northwest I mean in the northern New Mexico where some of my stackmen. Uh, have have experienced that. So, uh, if you wouldn't mind reaching out to find out if they they uh, would be interested in having one of these sessions, appreciate it. Uh, Rudy, I shall absolutely do so. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, and once again, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, uh, the panelists that were here that did a fantastic job. Uh, I know I'd like all of you to continue to talk a little longer, but sooner or later we have to. All good things must come to an end to be able to do that. Uh, again, thank you for that. Uh, to all the uh, attendees, please make sure you visit our website, um, uh, www.nibcoalition.com. We also have a Facebook page to be able to do that. Uh, I want to uh, tell you all uh, happy holidays as we head into this. Our next um, webinar will be sometime in the beginning of January, where we'll be talking about the Biden administration's first 100 days and how the NIB can work with that. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, everyone stay safe. And I'm going to tell you right now, the best thing you can do is to reach out to the people you know up and down your food chain to be able to talk to them about the importance of this bank. If you know somebody on the Biden transition team or you know somebody who has connections to that, your personal outreach can make a huge difference. 
at the end of the day, we have to build the parade so that the leaders can run to the front to be able to take us across the finish line. And that's what all of our jobs are. Every little step counts. None of us has the complete answer, but all of us has a small part to do and we need to do that. So with that, happy holidays and uh, have a great time. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks.